Hello, um, I'm Michael. I work at Modular, where I lead a PyTorch integration team. And um, in this talk, I would like to introduce you to our technology stack to explain what we are building, and also share some of the lessons that we learned from integrating with Torch Compile with a custom backend. So at Modular, what we are trying to do is we want to build the fastest, most efficient inference solution for machine learning models, and we call it MAX. Um, in the process of doing that, we also built a new programming language called Mojo, which probably you have heard about already. So let me first address the elephant in the room and explain why we did this, why we built a new language for this. Well, first of all, building new languages are always cool, so you should always do that. And whenever you face a new problem, the first question you should ask whether a new language would solve it better. And if the answer is yes or maybe, then you should definitely build it. Um, Second of all, existing languages are kind of boring. We feel that they never use enough emojis. So we wanted to fix at least this. And for our language, we even picked Fire Emoji as a file extension. So these were the main motivations. But we also had um, an actual use case at hand, which we wanted to address with this language. We needed a fast, fast kernels, library of fast kernels, really fast kernels. Um, uh, Phil mentioned that Triton reaches like 90% of the performance. We wanted the 100% or even more. So the way traditionally you do this is you write assembly or SAS or in our case, what we did, we wrote raw MLIR, which is slightly higher than assembly, but kind of the same deal. You don't need to understand this. It's just an example of terrible code that you don't want to maintain. So. We did that for several kernels. They were fast, but we realized that it doesn't really scale well. We don't want our engineers to suffer writing this, and we want at least nicer syntax. And that was the first requirement that we solved with, um, that we satisfied with Mojo. So we, were, we are able to write low-level code with a nice Pythonic syntax. So that was the first thing. But we also didn't want to stop there. We, we didn't want just a pretty assembly la language. We wanted our code to be um, composable so that we can build higher level abstractions and build libraries of quite high level concepts. And, and this, is what, this, this was the second um, requirement that we had for Mojo, and we successfully achieved it. To show you an example of how it looks in practice, I will show you three ways how we can implement uh, GPU kernels using Mojo. The first one is this ugly ver version like MLIR, you, you can literally emit MLIR that you want. You can use it in some cases when you want to full control over what you get, but obviously you don't want to always use this. On top of that, we built an abstraction layer that looks like CUDA. Again, you don't need to understand this code, but just appreciate that it looks much nicer than the one on the left. And um, you can see some similarities with like CUDA language. But again, that's not the end of the road. We, we went even higher and built another layer of abstractions, which allows you to define kernels in a more abstract way, in this case, using Tallinn abstractions. And what's cool about this is that it's all done in library. We don't need a special compiler to do this to be super smart. If you don't like Tallinn, how it's implemented, you can copy the code, modify it the way you want, and get what you, what you exactly want. So, with that, we, we were able to build our kernels library, but for the full solution, which, uh, which we want to build, we need a couple of more components, so let me say a few words about them. So kernel libraries is just the lowest level, but to run a model, you need some runtime that can dispatch these kernels. In our case, this runtime works on a generic graph IR, um, and this graph IR can be constructed from standard existing formats, we are front-end, and the formats we currently support are TorScript, Onyx, all the usual suspects, and now FX graphs as well from Torch Compile. Cool. So this is a high-level architecture of our system. So now let me shift gears and talk about Torch Compile, specifically about our experience of working with that. With Torch Compile, we have a very simple contract that it asks uh, custom backends to obey. Basically, your custom backend needs to be able to take an FX graph and return a callable that's equivalent to this FX graph. And for most systems like us, it's very natural um, interface. And the main thing is to teach your system to understand FX graphs. 
When we started to work on this, our system already understood TorScript. So the first original, first natural idea that we got is that, well, why don't we just convert effects to TorScript and, you know, save the work this way. Surprisingly, it, it did work out of the box, like almost with no effort. It was very easy. I believe um, in PyTorch codebase there is even an example of such, um, such a backend. So it, it is very easy to get started. However, soon after we realized that it has its problems. Specifically, the conversion from FX graph to TorScript loses some information. And if you don't care about 100 or more performance, then it's fine. But if you care about being best in the world, then it might be a deal breaker. Specifically, the conversion loses shape information of about intermediate tensors, so you cannot optimize using that. So even though it was a very nice a little experiment, which was easy to carry out, we had to abandon this approach and um, bite the bullet and start building the actual solution on working on native effects graphs. So the lesson here, if you're in a similar position, if you already have TorScript working, then just try it because it's very easy to do. But as you do it, remember that probably you will have to build the real one as well. Cool. So what, what makes it difficult to build the real solution that works with FX graphs directly? There are several challenges, and most of them stem from the fact that Touch Compile is a living project. It's still under active development, so you are dealing with a moving target. The IR that you get from FX graphs does not really have a strict reference, so you kind of have to guess what you can rely on and what you can't. Touch Expert is in a slightly better position, but Touch Compile is still underspecified in my opinion. Then. Um, there are a bunch of very useful fun functions that you can find in the code base. Basically, for almost every problem that you have, there is a function that solves it. But you never know if this function will survive the next release or not. So again, you have to like, you know, make a bet or copy it, and then this way you can make sure that it survives. Um, so these are the challenges, but um, it's not all, all that bad. And um, next, I want to share some suggestions, recommendations that hopefully can make your life easier if you're trying to do the same thing as we did. So first of all, whenever you work on a custom backend, you don't have to start from scratch. There are awesome existing projects that you can use as a baseline. A um, couple of mentioned here is Torch MLIR, which if you use MLIR, it basically just solves 90% of the problems that you might have. Um, and the second one is Inductor itself, which is the default uh, backend that exists in PyTorch. It's quite advanced, so if you face a problem, then there is a chance that Inductor has already solved it, so you can always use it as a cheat sheet for yourself. Um, so these external projects can help you to get your code up and running, and that's, that's great, but you might also want to gain some knowledge about you know, how PyTorch is designed, where it's moving over time, how some trade-offs were made in the past, etc. And for that, I'd like to share some other resources. First, first resource that I want to mention here is Developers Forum. I think it doesn't get enough attention from people, but it's like it's a mine of games. It, the documents shared there provide so much insight that you, I cannot under appreciate this. Like it, it, it's awesome. And the second one, which is probably even more awesome source, is a PyTorch Developer Podcast by Edward Young, who also had a talk here at the conference. It provides so much insights into the past, into the history of PyTorch, into its design principles, to how trade-offs trade were made, why they were made this way. So again, thank you, Edward, for this, and please keep doing this, and thank you for everyone who contributed to the forum as well. Uh, with that, let me wrap my talk, because we only have limited time here. I didn't want to go into too deep into details, but if you're interested, please find us at the poster session or somewhere around the conference. Uh, you can also join our Discord community or visit our website, and then you can follow what we do. Thank you again. <laughs>